And we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our top 10 films of 2023. I'm Robbie Fleming. I'm joined by the legends themselves, Cody House and Justin Doyle. Hello, guys. Hey, hey, Rob, what's up? How's it going? Good, good. It's nice and rainy here in Los Angeles. Don't get it a lot. It's actually like warnings about uh floods and stuff so very interesting lovely lovely so today we are talking our top 10 favorite films of 2023 we did this last year because we all did it so well i thought we could all do this again uh, this year beautiful beautiful and it's just uh, in the perfect time before we revealed the winners of the fleming awards which is when in uh, two weeks from now, on the 17th, the night before the BAFTAs. Oh, okay. Yes. Perfect. How's the voting coming along? It's going well. We're, nine, we're 18 votes off 100 now. Oh, beautiful. Yes. And with that all said and done, we'll let you go first, uh, Justin, because we don't have a clue what your favorite films are this year okay well, sounds good uh all right yeah i'll start it off and uh you know there's still some movies out there that i haven't seen so i'll have to yes. go with what i have seen and Same here yeah. is my yeah. number 10. one of my favorite uh animated movies of the year one of the subs as well it's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem is number 10. Nice. That's like in my top 15, but it just missed the list. It was a ton of fun. It gave us the nostalgia feels. It also, you know, updated from what we've seen before. Uh, but also the animation is, it's almost like claymation, but it's so drawn. It's beautifully drawn and created that it seems that way. Yes, yes. I enjoy this movie a lot as well because I really like the animation style. It's a bit more grittier than uh, Spider-Verse, which looks so nice and polished. But this one kind of becomes its own identity, and that's what I like about it. And the voice acting, I mean, come on, you have Jackie Chan, the, the, the Turtles and Newcomers, and the one that steals the show is A.O. Ed Deary. Yeah, absolutely. But also, yeah, Seth Rogen, who also created, you know, helped create the movie. Yes. Yeah, Ice Cube and Paul Rudd. Yeah, they were uh, great too. And Post Malone. And Post Malone. Did you like this one, Code? I enjoyed it quite a bit. I like that the turtles were actually voiced by teenagers. That's something that's never been done before in any of the interpretations of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, yeah. Just in the same age, so I was a huge Ninja Turtle kid growing up. Loved yeah. the original 1990 film. Um, it's a lot of fun, and I also love that Ice Cube quotes himself in the movie. Yeah, I mean, it, it's that's Seth Rogen, you know. He uh, he has that kind of humor. Yeah, um, yeah, did pretty well at the box office, hundred eighty one million, and uh, sitting at ninety five Rotten Tomatoes, which is crazy. I mean, this is ha, ha, who's heard of Robot Dreams? Should have been nominated. And I was talking to Colin about this. They should have waited to, to do that for the Oscars next year. What, the Robot Dreams? Yeah, because it might have had a bit more of like a chance. Well. That's, what, kicked... they did. That's what they did with Spirit of the Way. Oh, I see. Well, it kicked out Mutant Mayhem, which is fine because probably Boy in the Heron is going to win. But, uh, yeah, I just thought this was a lot of fun. I had a great time at the movie theater, and everyone else in the audience had a good time. And, uh, yeah, I like that we got to see something we love, but done just a little bit differently. Excellent. Excellent. Well done, Justin. And I'm going to read out my number 10. Ooh, Cody's anchor. All right, you ready for my number 10, gentlemen? Hit it. So this one came unexpectedly. And there's been this big trend of uh, product biopic. 
And I personally think the best one is about a product is about a product that doesn't even exist anymore. It's Blackberry. Yeah. Good choice. One of my favorite uh, supporting uh, performances this year. Absolutely. Uh, especially seeing something from him we don't know because all I know him from is it's always sunny in Philadelphia. So seeing him being an intimidated, yeah. scary guy was quite surprising. Definitely, definitely. But also really yeah. funny, you know, and you all. You yeah. almost don't take yeah, them that, that's because why I like the movie because it's quite smart with its with its balance of drama and uh, humor. But what I really love about it is it is it's trying to be honest. I know it says at the start of the film that it's a fictionalized version, but there was just so much honesty in it at the fact and also it portrays the nineties and the noughties as it should be, a really gritty hard time. Yeah. And the styling of the movie was well done. It, oh my uh, god, that was. Does 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 I know you like air, Justin? But that's kind of all polished and shiny and a little bit, you know, like too happy go lucky. This one's trying to be more honest about its rise and fall. Well, air I had Amazon. They had, had more. And... <laughs> yeah, and Blackberry's yeah, Canadian film, right? Yes, but credit goes to Matt Johnson because he's a, he seems like he's going to be a great director. And the script that he does with Matthew Miller is fantastic. I just want to see him uh, get more performances out of these actors. I mean, Jay Baruchel did try and do a good performance, but he's not. that wasn't a breakout role for him. I like no. that we have these character actors like Michael Ironside, Skull Rubenek, oh, and Gary so Alway. Michael Ironside is so good in this movie. He is, yeah. he is. But it's just Glenn Howerton that steals the spotlight in this movie and transcends him into a new limelight. And, and nothing to take away from Jay Baruchel. He definitely played the part and did the job. Like he, oh, he wasn't. Yes. He wasn't. Uh, 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 he was a good casting choice for sure. He was, he was, and yeah, and Matt Johnson was also in this, and he did a good job. And I want to see what he does in the future, and hopefully, he works with Glenn Howerton again. He also yeah. has a scene where he's referencing the franchise that was in Justin's number ten, because there's a whole scene where he's jamming to a rap song that's in the original. Ninja Turtle movie because that was supposed to be the movie night pick before like all the changes happen. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, uh, didn't uh, do well at the box office. It, I don't think people. This is more of word of mouth. Uh, you know, kind of have to dive a little bit deeper. There's also yeah. they for some reason released it on Hulu or something as a series. It's yeah, like it's on four. AMC Plus. They've extended it as to like a three-part miniseries. So I don't know what's extra in it. I just watched the movie version when I watched it because it has both options. Yeah, uh, it's awesome. And sitting at ninety-eight percent on Rotten Tomatoes, ninety-four from the audience. See, that's that's what that's a that's a star movie right there. Nobody's talking about it except for us. So yeah. good pick for your number ten. Thank you. Code. All right, my number yes. ten. Um, I don't know if it's a surprise that ended up on my list, um, but I didn't know anything about this movie till awards season, and then like it was hard for me to find it. I think it played one week in one theater in my area, but I got to rent it over the holidays, and it's just an incredibly well-made film, and I love to see like a courtroom drama that I've never seen before because it's a French film and it's Anatomy of a Fall. And not only that, it's also, it's also talking about relationships and do people, because the main character is a writer, so it's like, does you put your real life into your work and can that affect, like, would you tell on yourself if you committed a crime or not? It's just a really well-made, well-structured thriller. Oh, it is, it is a good that made a well-structured uh, thriller as well. I also like how it's told in three different languages. Mm-hmm, because she's 
speaks German, but it takes place in France, and then a lot of the times the movie's in English because of the language barrier between her and the other characters. Yeah. Also, if you can give a dog an Oscar, that dog deserves an Oscar. Yes. <laughs> that was probably the Still most uh, sinful scene in the movie for me, was the whole stuff with the dog. Yes. Definitely. I was hoping to watch it tonight, but I don't think I'm going to get to. Yeah, you should. You should. It might win best original screenplay. It could very well. Well, yes. I'll definitely watch it. It's nominated for best picture for. I'm yes. sure for. This was also for my fourth uh, favorite movie to be directed by a female director, and I think it's my third favorite international film. Nice. And nominated for five Oscars. Uh, yeah. Picture, director, so, actor, screenplay. I forget what the fifth one is. In, uh, not international. Yeah, uh, if you also like the uh, French films, editing, guys, film editing. I, I recommend the Three Mustard Tears movie that came out this year as well. That's uh, the one with Andy Green, right? Yes. Well, well, that's worth the recommendation just there. Yeah, I need to, I need to find that obscure actress we like. Uh, also, not really a, a theater box office blowout, but still no. doing all right. Twenty twenty five million at the it theater. It won the Palm d'Or at Cannes Film Festival. That's like the second biggest award after the Best Picture. Yeah, and this movie when it once it was released, it was the one that I heard about pretty much every week from somebody. Somebody had seen it, they loved it, and then it became, you know, bigger and bigger, doing well in the theater. Why didn't Titan do that? Titan was awesome. That's a little harder of a sale than a courtroom drama film, though. Yeah, that's a lot of uh, other issues that people have. Well, because it's an art house horror. Well, yeah, and I think the sexuality, like Saltburn, right? Yeah, weird sexuality. People don't. You're in the states, anyways. I don't know how to. Maybe you guys in the UK have gotten a little looser <laughs> than we have on that, but that's still a taboo thing in movies to like talk about with your relatives or some people because they're like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I'll, I might be talking about that in a bit. <laughs> what? Now, um, one of the movies that we've been talking about just. Okay. Get all the room in the list. All right. Well, uh, good pick, I think. I don't know. I haven't seen it yet, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to see it very, very Well, much. how should I say it better than where the troll dad think? <laughs> Yeah, the, um, the top movie of the year, right? <laughs> uh, all right. My number nine did really well in the box office and was my biggest surprise of the year. I didn't think I was going to enjoy this movie as much as I did. But I had a blast in this movie, and I thought that uh, the choices for actors worked out really well. Uh, especially it's hard to do something um, creative and original for with something that's already been a franchise. And I had a really good time in the Hunger Games, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. I need to catch up oh, on yeah. Hunger Games. I've oh, not seen yeah. that one or Locking J Part 2. Yeah, so this is a prequel uh, to the, the Hunger Games movies that we know. Uh, this one stars Rachel Zegler uh -huh. um, and Tom Blythe. Also, fantastic performance from Viola Davis. Gave two great supporting actress uh, performances this year. And this one was just really, really well done. I mean, the it's definitely more raw and gritty, if that can be uh, even possible, than from the uh, ones that we've seen before. But, um, yeah, the relationship between the two, 
really worked and actually they're a couple now i believe but the the fighting sequences is a lot more interesting than what we've seen from the ones before i got a it, it was losing me a little bit in the third act but uh the first two really make up for it and yeah, yeah viola davis is fantastic also peter dinklage is in it yeah. um but uh yeah and i also read the book and it was a really good adaptation um and the characters are really great i mean they really help bring this movie together yeah uh it's the same director of the hunger game in it. what was that i heard jason schwartzman is really good in it too yeah yeah he kind of he's the sort of i guess well character of what um stanley tucci was in the first one you know oh okay. uh, but he's great yeah he's really really good i think that's that's what it is is everyone was just really really good in this um and yeah i just it, it kind of shocked me that i enjoyed it so much so i had to bring yes. it to the table but yeah it did well at the theater 338 million uh not so great from the critics 64 percent, but the audience likes it was 89. same director as all the all the films except the first in the franchise right uh and is red sparrow yeah that? That's actually okay, pretty yeah, good. yeah he, he's an interesting director he's got an interesting visual eye is he the same yeah. one who did uh i am legend yes in he constantine did I am legend. he did constantine water for yeah. elephants Yep. I've seen that one. Uh, and then a bunch of music videos. He was like a music yeah, that's video. Yeah, what he start. That's where he got his start. There might be a music video director on my list, but I'm not saying. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, last year he created Slumberland. You oh yeah, that's that? right. Uh huh. No, yeah. this is way better than Slumberland. Uh, that's yeah. Imagine. I don't know how it's gonna play at home, but it played well at the theater. And I enjoyed that. So it's nice, my nice. nice. Unfortunately, my number nine, I didn't have a chance in the theater because it never played. I brought it on Blu ray and I absolutely uh, loved it. I understand why this film would not be for, ev for everybody because it does have a simple and basic plot. But I think if it wasn't a director as good as Neil Blomkamp, it wouldn't have been fantastic. It's a Gran Turismo. <laughs> yeah another surprise of the year too yeah yes. we'll see the recreation of like the cars that part of the movie was interesting yeah i did like that part of it ah sweet so yeah, yeah this yeah on, on yeah. paper it is the standard boy goes some rags to riches he has parents that don't believe in him but he has Somebody there to, who has hope for him to be his mentor. It's got time of the, the one like rival. It, I get it, it's probably similar to Days of Thunder or Ford versus Ferrari, but for me, I think with Neil Blomkamp being the director and just handed the script, he managed to make this really, really like good. Like, and this isn't a film like it's weird, it's a weird, it's a weird argument because. It is based on the video game, but it is an original story based on somebody. Yeah, it is a true life story that they're bringing it. So it's a, yeah. But they put a lot of the video game elements into the movie. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. what makes it stand out from other race cars. It's like it's the one in between something like Rush and then something like Speed Race, and this one's in the middle. Mm hmm. Like it's yeah, authentic and a bit like video game ish too. The video, the uh, visual effects and the stunts in this are pretty yeah. top notch. But yeah, Archie, and, Archie Malwaki uh, is one of my uh, breakout stars of the year up, yeah. because of this and another film that I talk about later. But David Harbour, Jamin Husu, always give great performances, and this Lando is the one Bloom. movie that shows Orlando Bloom can actually act. Nah. Yeah, I just hope Dejamon got a really good paycheck because he deserves more than, than be uh unapproving to approving father. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did pretty well. Double its money, 121 million. 65% yeah. from the critics, but the audience loved it, 98%. Yeah, good. Great number nine. Good. All right. I don't just like to lean to one side. I know I like to do a bit of writing, but I do love the the crowd pleasers. Nothing yeah. wrong with that. Um, I'm probably not going to talk much about my number nine because it's going to be brought up later, I think. I'm pretty okay, sure. It's okay, gonna... but I'm going to add this new rule in. Whoever brings it up first gets to talk about it first. Okay. Well. Uh, my number nine is one of the biggest movies of the year. I mean, not a too big of a shock based on who directed it, but, but a but little. We'll, bit. But we'll wait till we match on the thing before we dive into it properly. Okay, but let's hear what it is first. Sure. Okay. So my number nine is one of the biggest movies of the year, which is not a surprise based on who directed it, but it is a surprise because it was a three-hour rated R biopic. But I think this is Christopher Nolan's best movie since Inception. It was incredibly well done. It was well paced. I didn't know that it was going to be like a JFK style type of bio movie about the the creation of the atomic bomb and the man who created it. But yeah, it's Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer's my number nine, which is which will be on my list later on. Back to back uh, courtroom dramas, huh, Coach? Yeah, it's true because this this has a little bit of a courtroom drama feel to it as well with the whole. Yeah. Well, actually, with the whole Robert Downey Jr. plot line with him getting possibly nominated for the presidential cabinet and the whole ordeal that they're giving Oppenheimer while we're also dealing with the creation of the bomb and, you know, the war between Nazis and the Japanese. And man, is this movie stacked with actors. I mean, Christopher Nolan got everybody he could get to be in this movie. And they're all good, even though there's at least a dozen people who are underwritten. But this is the Oppenheimer show. So Killian Murphy did a great job being a lead actor in this movie. Yes, he did. He did. All right. We'll talk more about it later. Sweet. Okay. My number eight is uh, one that people just did not like. They didn't get. It was uh, uh, one that has stuck with me since my, my top five from earlier. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> the worst the, movie of the year in my head. This movie is weird. But you know what? This year is the year of weird. And I enjoyed a lot of weird movies this year because I, I need something different. We've been seeing all this stuff. It's always the same. You know, that's why I like Mutant Mayhem and, and because it was different from what we've seen before. And uh, even Songbirds, it was different from The Hunger Games, even though it's, you know, pretty similar storyline. But I also think that this director has been bad in a thousand and it's ari aster and it's joaquin phoenix in bo is afraid it's, it's an honorable mention for me just and i really did enjoy it as well because yeah i think this movie perfectly captures anxiety can i just parenting. please explain why i do not like the film I can't sure. explain why you don't like it. I mean, it's just not a movie for everybody. Okay. But again, the reason why I don't like it is because I'm trying to work out whether this is happening or whether this is in his head. There's no explanation for what's going on. It's, it's just one device laws of physics. This is somebody who not only loves the films of Terry Gilliam, but is a fan of the Fast and Furious franchise. This is, um, I think it's simultaneously, some of it is happening for real, and some of this is, like, all made up, like, he's, he's making it worse than it is because of his fears. And, and not only that, but it's framed as a horror, but plays out as a comedy, but also has a bit of drama and a bit of, and well, ever seen that, that, like, an hour of this film, but on a journey, like, what does this movie want to be? You yeah, it was that. Horror and comedy. They're very similar. Yeah. To set up a scare 
is the same setup as a joke. And yeah. a lot of times, lots of horror movies have humor in it. Uh, because because, because I've, been meaning, I've been meaning to show this to Sean. I think he's just going to laugh his head off. And I'm going to be like, but don't you understand what this movie's about? And he's just going to be having a laugh. Also, I laugh my head yeah. off in this movie. Also, I love that Mariah Carey showed up to the premiere of this movie. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it is about um, uh, what Cody was saying is like you 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 over uh, you see something and then you make it bigger than what it actually is and you just think you know it's just all in your head and um, and people go through this stuff you know no, uh, no, no I, I'm anxiety it's just I, I I I I have a different interpretation of it I don't picture a man's on my ceiling about to jump on me. Well, just that the you know, it's it just starts so crazy, and he thinks that everyone is out to get him, you know, in the streets, and also. Yes, but uh, how many of us have Google scrolled or death scrolled when we're like taking medication and we look up the side effects or something, and we're like, right, "Oh crap, exactly. I'm gonna die." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but Joaquin Phoenix gives a great performance, as he always does. I'm not but also... watching any of the actors in this. I personally think Bailey. The poe was the best. Yeah, I was just about to say that um, one of my favorite supporting roles of the year comes from Patty <laughs> Lapone in this movie. She was great as his mother. Uh, but yeah, there's also a weird uh, uh, penis in the end. So yeah, that, things... that's, that's the thing that threw me off the whole movie. It's like, how right. is this possible? I think that was uh, intentional and smart, and it really made me laugh. Uh, it, it, if it's one thing for sure, this is a very bodacious, original, okay, but, of a movie. Okay, yeah. but I'm just going to say that Robert Eggers is a much better director and... I can't wait for his Nosferatu movie. Robert Eggers is all my guy. Well, we shouldn't even be comparing the, the two. Page. Yeah, we, this, this, we should. We shouldn't even compare them. They're uh, the only thing that they've done is have the same amount of movies in everyone's their art house movies. Uh, but also, Amy Ryan's in this super great. Nathan Lane, Nathan Parker Lane. Posey, Richard Parker Posey. I forget the actor that plays the psychiatrist. He's really good too. The one's a Richard book. Kind. Uh, uh, Stephen the oh, Stephen McKinley Henderson. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, he was great. Uh, and also, Bill Hader played the UPS guy in the yeah. funny part. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That was a pretty great scene too. Like that's some great just voice acting. Yeah. Yeah. So what was um, his goal? Over on uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, yeah, this one did not do well in the theater. Sixty-seven percent from the uh, critics, seventy-one from the audience. So they agree, but I enjoyed it. It's weird, and I liked it. I'm not knocking you for liking it. I just I it, know it, you it, don't like the movie. It's the worst movie of the year. We get it. No, it's Ruby Gilman, actually. Ruby Gilman's the worst film of the year. <laughs> All right. Well, we're talking about the best, so let's keep that going. Yeah. What's your number eight? So I really like this director that came out in 2020. She has made the best movie of this decade so far. So I was really looking forward to her second movie, which tells the dark story of, but comedic story, of young Oliver Quick and his adventures in Saltburn. Honorable mention. On my list. So we shall hold off. Yes. Yes. What you got for number eight, Cody? Okay, well, once you guys know the title I and mean, you know the director, you're not going to be surprised this is on my list. Uh, I thought this was probably one of the most entertaining films of the year. It's dealing with a, a lots of narration. It's a solo character. Um, it's a guy who's obsessed with his work. Um, 
It's a lot of things that check my box. It's directed by David Fincher. I also love right. that David Fincher is kind of making fun of himself and his style in this movie. I love that it's a movie about a guy who talks about don't have any of emotions, but he's listening to the Smiths nonstop, who are maybe the most emotional band ever. It's David Fincher's The Killer. Honorable mention. Yeah, I just I had a lot of fun with this movie. I like it. I like the idea, but I have an issue. The trailer made it look like an action movie, but there was only one uh, like stunt. Uh, oh, but that fight scene was incredible. It was, but it was the only fight scene in the movie. And I, I, I don't know. It just, it just checked all the boxes. But for what I think I this is his decade-defining movie of the 2020s. Well, just, 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 direct, just because it direct. uses a lot of modern like trends, like he like he uses like a smartphone, he uses like a smartwatch, he he has like an electric bike. Mm -hmm. I love that his pulse has to be sixty before he can do his hits. I love that he's eating an egg McMuffin, but he takes the bread off of it. Yeah, have you seen this one, Justin? I have. What did you make to it? Uh, it's something we've seen before. I thought it was interesting, though. I like Michael Fassbender. Uh, I like every. I like all the times that he went to his hits. You know, every uh, those were all really, really well done. Um, yeah, the soundtrack was great. Yeah, I mean, there's there's nothing you can say bad about this movie. It's it's uh, masterfully put together, but. We've definitely seen it before. <laughs> yes. So yes, um, Elda Swinton was good in it for her scene. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Like David Fincher's like making fun of himself for like the kind of movies he makes, like the kind of protagonist he has, and like his personification of what people think about David Fincher. I think he's like having a bit of fun in this. I've never looked at it that way before, but that's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, well, because he knows, like, in the opening shot when he's playing How Soon Is Now, he's like, you guys want, like, this to go the way it's supposed to, and then things don't go the way it's supposed to. Like, he's, he's messing with his fans a little bit, I think. Maybe that's why it's a slow burn thriller rather than a action movie like the trailer made it out to me well also it says in the beginning if you if you can't get adjusted to boredom this is not the job for you <laughs> yeah uh did you no, i didn't mind the slow burn i just was expecting it to be a bit more actiony i didn't, i like the pace it's fine did you uh like the ending I mean, the ending was fine, yeah. I mean, I didn't think that's where the movie was going to go, but cool. <laughs> you know? It's yeah, a good definitely. way to... I, I also think it's funny that this guy's like no attachments, no nothing, and it's all a revenge. It becomes a revenge plot. I also love that he uses uh, all his fake names or sitcom characters. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, pretty good. On 86% from the critics, but 61 from the audience. What was the IMDb uh, score? IMDb is 6.7. That's not bad. I thought it'd be a bit higher, but it's not that bad. Critics say it's stylish and engaging thriller. Yeah. Uh, but the audience says that it's, it will be a hit for Fincher fans, but others might find it dull or even pretentious. No, that's how I would describe the movie. Both uh, opinions are right. They are. Yeah, <laughs> kind of makes it a good movie. Yeah. All right, Justin, hit me up with your number seven. All right. Uh, my number seven is a fun, thrilling movie. Did not think it was going to go the route it did. Uh, it was a surprise to me. Uh, it is a period piece. 
also based on a true story and also based on a product. Taron Edgerton gives great performance in Tetris. I this is the story yeah, of the most. Tell us all about it. Yeah, it's a story of the most popular game that found its way to players around the globe. One of the first ever sort of uh, handheld video games. Uh, it's it's is similar to, I guess, Social Network, where it was somebody's idea and then somebody else made it bigger than what it was, uh, yeah, and, or what it what it could have ever been, and. Yeah, I think it was just really, really smart, and it becomes like part like the killer, where it's a thriller, uh, uh, espionage sort of movie. Um, Apparently, that never and, happened in real life. Yeah, yeah, this is a true story, and it's over a video game. I mean, it's just intense. There's, there's actually, I don't want to give too much away from it, Cody, because it is a lot of fun. But there's car chase scenes and and fight scenes, and this is really what happened. Uh, yes, but... this it sounds a bit too over the top than what really happened. You have to understand, Justin, that these biopics aren't exactly true. You know, yeah, I can play out all the, I can out all the all the analysis in Bohemian Rhapsody, but we'll save that for another video. Yeah, this is based on a true story, so it's not, uh, you know, it's not necessarily the true story. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can make a, a game who's that that it's actually, if you look at it now and what we have now, kind of boring and slow, and no, make I it, it in an incredible, uh, <laughs> fun movie. Um, but yeah, a businessman, the Tetris inventor, joined forces with the USSR. Uh, risking it all to bring this game to the masses. Nice. Uh, yeah, Toby Jones is also in it. Um, directed by John S. Baird. You guys know him? No. He did Stan and Ollie, one of my favorite movies from 2018. Nice. Uh, yeah, and then some TV. But yeah, it's... It just was started to seem like it was going to be one thing and just became something completely different. And that was awesome to me. Nice. So Tetris is my number seven. Uh, didn't have a release for theaters except for one week. But uh, same with like The Killer. The Killer didn't have a good theatrical run or any really at all. 81% Rotten Tomatoes. 88. 81 from the critics, 88 from the audience. Nice. You still haven't seen this one either, or did you, uh, Rob? No, uh, no, I have not. I don't have Apple TV, so it's hard to watch these movies. All right. Well, two movies I uh, you guys haven't seen on my list so far. Yeah. Uh, all right. One number seven is one all three of us have seen because it's part of. A big franchise, but I think this is the the the, the perfect cutoff point for the classic post Endgame MCU, and that's Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. Uh, honorable mention for me, but I, I love this movie very much. It was a fantastic farewell to Gunder of the Guardians. I have nothing but respect for that man for what he's done for comic book movies. I wish him the best at DC. I really hope he brings us more movies like this. I mean, I can just dive into this movie all day. The storyline is just so perfect how it just focuses on Rocket's story. It doesn't make him a MacGuffin like it does with uh, Ironheart or America. He's an actual fleshed out character. And he always has been as well, which, which also adds to it. Karen Gillan gives her best performance as Nebula. Uh, the, the new villain, uh, Chugwick, what an actor. Mm. He's like some Shakespearean actor who thinks he's in this brand new movie. Like, I am surprised he's not been in the award talk. I know it's a long shot. Yeah, he's really, really good. <laughs> yeah. This is my favorite franchise in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and it's because James Gunn makes these characters lovable 
and it's got humor, but it also has heart, and you feel for these characters. I mean, if we had talked about this a decade ago, you would not think this would be one of the most endearing franchises about a talking raccoon and a talking tree, or that Dave Bautista would be one of the most interesting characters in a movie as Drax the Destroyer, but you love all these people, and... You know, James Gunn's also great at the needle drop by connecting the songs oh and the themes of the movie. And um, what's his name? Is it Will Porter? He's hilarious. I know it's yeah, not the comic version of Adam, but he's hilarious in it. There is one moment that makes me cry, and it's when they play Bug Days Are Over by Florence and Machine. Mm-hmm. As soon as I hear that song, I start to cry. It's perfectly placed. And, um, yeah, Maria Bakalova as Cosmo did a really good job as well. Well, she's fantastic as well. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm glad that that... Nathan Fillion, too, in this. Yeah, he's great. Um, Nominated for an Oscar for visual effects. It's a long shot, but it could win. Um, did really well in the theater, of course. Yeah, eight hundred and forty-five million, eighty-two percent on Rotten Tomatoes, with a ninety-four percent from the audience. Nice. Glad we all enjoyed yeah. this one. Oh yeah, I mean it's it is probably the best uh, trilogy, maybe uh, um, in America. Well, it wouldn't. Well, it wouldn't be Ant Man, would it? God no. <laughs> no. Numbers. Oh yeah. Right. Sorry, Justin, take it away. I was just gonna say number seven from Code. Oh, my number seven. Okay. I just don't think you guys liked as much as I did, but that's okay because you know this is all subjective. It's all our personal tastes and our favorite films. But this is from a master. This was a year of master filmmakers making movies. Definitely. Uh, and this is this is an epic. It's making a statement. It's talking about the atrocities that we've committed as Americans to our own citizens and a story that wasn't widely known. And it was originally going to be more of a true crime investigation, and that would have been a very good movie too. But I think it was brave of Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio to take a different approach with this movie. And my God, what a performance from Lily Gladstone. Um, I think she's got a great career ahead of her. She was the heart of this movie. But it's uh, Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon. Very good. Yes, it is very good. Very, very good. The only thing I would change is I wouldn't swap so I would just swap the two actors around. I would have Jesse Plemons and Leonardo DiCaprio play each of his roles. But I, I think it's interesting for DiCaprio to take a role that normally he wouldn't play, that he kind of uglies but, himself. But this up. feels like a role that he should have played 30 years ago when he was a young man. He feels like he should have played more of an old role. He could have played the Nero's role and Chalamet could have played his role. Yeah, but Jesse Plemons playing the <laughs> we've seen Plemons play that role. So to give Plemons a smaller role and get to be kind of one of the more heroic characters was interesting. Okay, and- I'm going to be honest with you. My favorite performance in this movie uh, doesn't come till the very end of the film. Well, it's not the very end, because there's the whole epilogue of Coda at the end of the movie, which I, I love that little inclusion, yeah, too. Yeah, that, that was one of my favorite scenes, actually, the transition to AJ plays, because I've always I did one at college, and I've always wanted to get into doing them. Also, I think they did a very good job of being respectful and honorable to the Osage Nation because they have yeah. mostly had anything but good things to say about this movie and, like, the research and work they went into to, to be respectful. And this yes. is something we need to talk about because it's something that's widely forgotten. And Yeah, definitely, you know. definitely. Like, I always prefer Western 
Uh, when when there are Native Americans in it, that's why I like Dancing with Wolves a lot more than Django Unchained. Yeah. But, I mean, if there's anyone that's been poorly misrepresented or not enough representation in America society, it's the indigenous people of this land. Okay, it does, you don't mind that I prefer Dancing with Wolves to this one, do you? No, I mean... Look, it's all personal taste. Um, as long as you don't tell me Kevin Costner's a better director than Martin Scorsese. Oh, God, God, God no. God, uh, no. I think this was... But he's nowhere near Scorsese level yet. I'm even surprised that he beat Scorsese to an Oscar that year. Yeah. Uh, I think from the very start, this movie was beautifully shot. Like that first oh, yeah. opening opening scene is so well done, uh, and it really set the tone for the rest of the movie. And then immediately after is just brutal murder, so that also set the tone for the movie. Uh, uh, it is uh, a ma- just like you said, a masterpiece from a from a masterful director. Oh, it, this is... it, it gets a five star rating from me for effort, and it is in my honorable mentions. But it just that three hour pacing, three and a half hour, three and a half hour. It just that like with I just preferred another three hour long epic to this one. Fair enough. Yeah, I also think the score is amazing. Uh, it is Richardson, Richardson and um, the costuming is phenomenal. I just listened to a podcast where they had her talking about it and how when the consultant came in was just surprised at all the research she had done to make the costuming look authentic. Yeah. Yeah. And the production design is incredible. You, you know, you can tell that they had to build it. I, I do. I, I will say that the cinematography does try some good angles. I think that's what I like about Rogergo Pietro, the cinematography. cinematographer. He's always trying to find like interesting angles to use and he does shoot another film I will be talking about shortly. Uh yeah, nominated for ten Oscars. Best oh, picture, best song, be, uh best achievement, uh score, director, actress, and uh, per- uh, lead performance supporting actor. Uh, for Mr. De Niro, cinematography, film editing, production design, and costume design. Do we no, think they're going to win any? No, sadly not. Only if, for some reason, Lily ends up winning. That's probably, and that's what that's they get. That's the only good chance. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's either her or that Justine guy, huh? Um, or uh, Sarah Hewler or whatever. No, I think no, 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 no. Oh, well, Rob's coming in with the real answer. I know you do that is. What? And I will reveal it later on. But uh, no adapted screenplay, sadly, I probably because of where they switched Barbie and category. But yes, and, uh, but because I, but because I have a brain and put Barbie in original, I got to nominate this one for the Flemings. Yay also, for the awards! Scorsese is now the most nominated director living. He, this is his tenth nomination. How many has Spielberg got? Nine. Nine. Spielberg has a nine Ooh. nomination. Ooh, baby! All right, uh, Justin. This one did pretty well. Didn't make yes, back its did. money, however. 156 million, uh, 93 from the audit or from the critics, and 84 percent from the audience. And before we end it, I just want to point out Brendan Fraser stole the show. I don't know if he stole the show, but no, he was good. That's not true. Yeah, he was. He f- did what he was supposed to do, and he kind of overacted. So I don't even. I don't know. <laughs> well, he was, was a bad overact. It was kind of good overact. Thing. He didn't need to, but he just did just to make sure he was good. Any last uh, notes, code for killers? Um, I think it's just an astonishing achievement and an important story. And you know, if this ends up being Marty's last film, hopefully it's not. What a picture to make! 
Yeah, he yeah, he did a good job. He did a good job. Solid movie, right. just solid movie. Yeah. I just uh, prefer these other ones. Obviously. All right. Uh, let's go down to number six. Ooh, we're getting close here. Uh, yes, yeah. Well, we've already talked about a bunch of uh, notable directors, iconic directors, and this one's no different. Didn't get a lot of love, but boy, did I have a really, really good time. Not only with the performance, although he didn't really embody the character or the person who I think that Napoleon was, but again, another great performance from Joaquin Phoenix in Napoleon, directed by Ridley Scott. Uh, it you is... Don't find this one boring, but you, you don't like Gladiator. I never said I didn't like Gladiator. I like Gladiator. It's fine. I was trying to watch this last night, but I chose not to because it's going to be on Apple TV soon. I'm very mad at myself that I didn't see this in theaters because this definitely belongs in I'm, theaters. I, I, sold meant this, to be seen. I, I sold this in, in cinema and I was bold. All right. Can I just talk about why I like it first and then you can discuss why you hate it so much? I don't hate that's, it. That's what we're here to do. Sorry. Right. So, Joaquin Phoenix is uh, again not he's I don't think he's embodying who Napoleon was or what he was but he brought in his own sort of characteristics kind of like what he does for all of his characters I mean you know in the master he's did you think that they were supposed to hunch over and be like that you know that's not a it was a person that he was just able to create and I think he kind of created Napoleon to be his own and I found it humorous I thought he was just kind of like a, a bumbling idiot at times. I mean, he just, he's not really smart, but you know, he has power and that's all he wants to do is abuse it. Um, the war and epic battle scenes here is superb. Ridley Scott knows what he's doing when it comes to that anyway. He knows how to make epic battles and it is proven here. Uh, it, you know, it did get some nominations and the costume design is incredible. Their production design is incredible. I didn't really care for Vanessa Kirby, who plays Josephine. She doesn't seem... It was originally supposed to be... Um, huh, what's her name? She was in The Last Duel. It was supposed to be her originally. Oh, Comer? She would have been better. Yeah, Jody yeah Comer. actually, the, I do think that. She, she probably would have done better. Uh, but it is just a huge, huge movie, large scale, and it worked for me. Uh, you know, this is more, this is half and half about the war, uh, the winds, you know, uh, stuff like that. But it's also about the relationship between him and his wife, Josephine. He wanted a son. She wasn't able to bear it for him. But, uh, yeah. And I laughed a lot. Again, I think Joaquin Phoenix is one of the best actors out there. And he, he can, is do no wrong and he did no wrong in napoleon and i don't know why people are i guess it's boring but i didn't find it that at all uh i think the visuals will make you want to keep you know viewing is, and seeing what's it coming a visually stunning film it has some good shots and some good battle scenes but this is meant to be the most interesting man in the world and it's kind of boring also I swear that this film, again, I could probably point out the historical inaccuracies. Like yeah, this, well, just like... This, this, this is like Braveheart. Yeah, just you, like you, I said with... Visuals, uh, a made-up story that, that... I'm not saying you guys do, but some people think it actually happened when it didn't. And I don't want this movie to have the same effect. Um, well, just like I was saying, he didn't embody Napoleon. I don't think that this movie was historically accurate. I think this is, you know, just kind of based on events that happened. Yeah. Um, but it's it's really well done. If you, if you like uh, Return of the King battle, you'll definitely like some of the battles in this. Yeah. Against real people, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, didn't do well in theaters. Um, well, $219 million, but still didn't make its money back. And, 
two two big movies for Joaquin this year, but I guess uh, COVID pushed it back. Fifty eight percent from the uh, critics and fifty nine from the audience. Oh, they're they're pretty even on that. Yeah, don't let that deter you, Code. I'm gonna watch it anyway because uh, just because. I just got I, I just try and do what Justin does and just try and watch as many movies as I can. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. It All is. right. Number six. For me? Yep. It's the biggest movie of the year. I don't know if this film leaves an introduction. My number six is Barbie. Which we'll be talking about later because it'll be higher on my list. Lovely, lovely, excellent, excellent. We'll we'll move on and let you talk about your number six code. Well, my number six is a delicious melodrama that is part comedy, that is part serious drama. It's almost a docudrama because it's loosely based off a news story that was popular when I was in junior high. Even though it's not that news story, you know that's where they're taking the liberty from, and it's got bonkers performance from its two leading ladies, Natalie Portman and Julianne Moore. But I gotta say, maybe the MVP of this movie is Charles Melton, because he's having to keep it together and be the straight man in this bonkers movie from the master of melodrama himself, Todd Haynes, that's May-December. Nice. Yes. I loved this movie as well. It's not on your list. No, not on my list. I I thought it'd be I thought it would be on your list, but I read your uh, review on it. Yeah, I mean it's it's I laughed throughout. I don't think you're you know, Todd Haynes was was saying you guys should be laughing. This is this does have comedy to it. It is dark comedy, but uh yeah, I also you know knew about this very much when it happened, and to make a whole movie about it, you know, it was bound to happen. But to bring out the stars like uh, Julianne Moore and they, 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 they do. I will admit again, five star for effort. It was really well written and had three amazing performances, and I don't get why julianne or natalie didn't get a single best actress nomination I because they took did not like this movie because of the direction it's in and like kind of what it's saying about actors that is this is the thing there's this uh there's this backdrop about what actually happened that's 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 just as interesting as what's happening it's kind of like the whale where, where you know about this the subplot involving like the backdrop of this whole of what's led to this event, and it plays out really interestingly and really adds to the depth of the movie. Well, the and I think Melton is also playing a character that's in an arrested development, right? Because he was so young when this relationship started that even though he's like a 35, 36 year old man in the events of this movie, or he's at least someone in his. 30s like he doesn't act like an adult in his 30s because of what happened and like him coming to terms with all that yeah and Dude. this and this is what i but yeah i just think the film should have been should have been should this issue should have been discussed a little bit seriously instead of just play it straightforward as a comedy I don't think it's straightforward as a comedy. Though. No, there's definitely nice. there's definitely drama and darkness to this. It's not it's not necessarily a comedy. Just that the um, performances are over the top because it's melodrama. Yeah, and and it does it starts it makes you feel one thing at the beginning, and then you feel something completely different towards the end. Yeah, yeah which is I, great. I mean, it's I should, on a roller coaster ride. Maybe I should rewatch this movie. It was the first one that I really was like, oh, this this is going to be up for some awards, and then wasn't. Only, <laughs> Except for only three, three nomination. Yeah, That's the screen, a, screenplay. Yeah. Which I'm happy for. It's I can't great. believe it's only my awards that gave it proper acting award nominations. 
No, there was others. There was others. Melton no, was up for a bunch press of for time. Do you want to just do your top five? No, it's fine. We're we're okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, it's it was good, and the performances really helped it uh, be as good as it is. But the reason why Natalie Portman and Julianne Moore didn't get nominated is because the other uh, uh, force, the the resistance uh, from Nyad were up. So it was like, which duo should we have in there? That's that's one movie I've been dreading to watch. I want to watch it because it's been nominated, but I don't want to watch it at the same time because I don't want to obviously waste it. The made in the movie, though, I will say that. I need to see it still. So you don't understand Annette Bening's uh, nomination? No, I mean, I get it, but at the cost of Margot Robbie or Greta Lee not getting in, that's the performance I would take out. Or even Natalie Portman or Julianne Moore. Like, yeah. they were just better performances. This year. Yeah. Uh, 90% from the critics, 67 from the audience. I mean, that makes sense. I understand. All right. Uh, my number five. Something that... Um, I enjoyed very, very much and my only documentary on my list and it's definitely worth it. Uh, towards the end, I was watching it through tears in the eyes. Uh, I just thought this was a beautiful movie. It actually was shot like a narrative, even though it's a documentary. Yes. And I thought that was really impressive. Um, it's about love and dealing with um, cancer, but also trying to create your career make it what it is and have it be something that is worth talking about which his career is definitely worth talking about he makes beautiful music it's john patiste and this is american symphony it should be nominated another another snub it is nominated for best song but it should be nominated for best documentary and it is it didn't um, but I love second best uh, documentary movie this year. Yeah, I mean, still also got snubbed. It should have been up, but uh, yeah. also a really good movie. My favorite was the Maripol one. Yeah, well, that got nominated. There was uh, uh, a lot of I also watched... real life documentaries about like a subject. For <laughs> um, but yeah, this guy is. Uh, a great conductor of music and really just puts puts it out there it's orchestra it's you know he leads a whole group and creates music but also is married to somebody who's dealing with cancer and uh this is during the COVID time and he's you know also going to the grammys for his album and stuff and so what do you you and your family's this way and your life is going this way what do you do uh but really really good just again the way that it was shot is definitely something that should be noticed because you don't see that in a lot of documentaries uh available on netflix didn't have a theatrical run except for the week and uh miss this one code yeah i got around to seeing this one yeah it's good yeah 94 percent from the critics 83 from the audience not a lot of view, uh, uh, reviews though and ratings so did all the obama uh, yeah. that he produced he produced three right yeah american symphony the uh, end of the world and rustin and and rustin yeah so end of the world didn't but the other two Yes, I just need to see Left, left, left the World Behind. That's his, thought. That's his name. Uh, yeah. I enjoyed that one a lot. Yeah, I need to see it still. Yeah, I haven't seen it. I'm surprised you've not uh, seen a Julia Roger, Roberts film. I know, I know, but I need to catch up on everything, like El Conde. You do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number five. Let's yes. roll. 
Sadly, uh, Al Conde did not uh, meet the cut this time. But the next time, uh, but the next time a hidden gem comes out, trust me on it. Next time, that's impossible. I trust you. I trust you on a TV show, and you're not even a TV expert. Well, I'm no expert on movies either. I just, uh, I just like them. Uh, yeah. What's your number five, Rob? A film idea that should have never worked. Never worked because there is nothing. It's based on a story that I love. I love the book. I love the original adaptation. I'm a bit 50 50 on the 2005 attempt. But I love the film. It's by a director I love, stars and actor I love, a supporting cast that I love. And that movie was Wonka. A lot of fun, a lot of heart, great costume. Yes, just, Had a fun the way, time. Just, just the way this world is built and like crafted from the talents of Paul King and Simon Farnaby. They craft a script that not only allows the film to breathe on its own, but plays homage to the beloved classics of the seventies movie. I mean, the 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 cast. Timothy Chalamet, he's no Jim Wilder, but he's at least better than Johnny Depp. Olivia Coleman, Jim Carpenter, Rowan Atkinson, Patterson Joseph, Matt Lucas, Sally Hawkins, Hugh Grant. And obviously we have the standout, Callum Lane as Noodle. Fantastic character, and the, my favourite of the movie. Keegan Michael Key, the brilliant portrayal of the corrupt police chief and the uh, not just that, but a cleverly executed joke that stems about his greed and it just pulls off perfectly <laughs> that layer of humour to this movie. But this idea shouldn't have worked, but Paul King and Simon Farnby made it work. I love them songs, I listen to them on Spotify a lot. I just think that I just don't get how this movie was so good. Paul King. Paul King, yes. That's why. Yeah, it's a really good family movie. Definitely. Um, it, you can pull everyone, you know, for something for everybody. Uh, they tricked people then thinking that it was a regular movie and it was a musical. Uh, They've been doing that a lot just, lately. Yeah, which is fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, get people to the theater still. Um, and, and that, yeah, it gave us a couple a couple of them that we didn't know were going to be musicals for that year. But, uh, yeah, I think everything that's been said is correct, except for Timothy Chalamet just not being as charismatic or anything at all. I mean, he was just Timothy Chalamet. He gave me nothing. Timothy and, Chalamet is uh, very charismatic in real life, he sounds. Well, then he did. He should have acted like himself a little bit more because it did not work out for me in this one. And I and I uh, like him fine. I will say he was better than Johnny Depp though, because his Wonka wasn't scary. Could well, you buy Wonka Hugh was... Grant? Could you buy Hugh Grant as an umbrella with Justin? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, <laughs> Hugh Grant's Hugh Grant is having the best time of his career right now. He's he's just in movies, you know, supporting roles. Movie. He really elevates the movies. Yeah, like even in the Rue, Rue de Guerre from last year, he wasn't, he was, you know, just having fun. And you can tell he's enjoying his time. I right prefer now. him in The Gentleman. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this was an in, a highly anticipated movie for me. And uh, I wish it, it would have been on the list had it not been for Timothy Chalamet being miscasted. But the rest of it is amazing. <laughs> it wasn't I, like the... I couldn't picture any any other actor his caliber playing. Could you see Harry Styles in that role? He's not, not an actor. Been. He's been in three movies. He's barely an actor. And only one of uh, them did he have more than um, than two sentences. Yeah, and and he was one of the worst parts of that movie. So uh, <laughs> yeah. doesn't say much about it. Uh, the audience and the critics, all and the uh, you know everyone went to the theater watching this. Five hundred seventy-one million did really well. Eighty-three from the critics, ninety-one from the audience. 
uh, I do want to watch it again and give it another try, but I don't. I didn't enjoy it the first time around, and it was kind of not as mad. You're, you're a fan of Rowan Atkinson. Yeah, I like Rowan Atkinson. I'm also I like I like him as much as I like Hugh Grant. You know, maybe a little less. But just because somebody's in a movie doesn't mean I'm going to like it more. True. All right, number five for Code. Yes. All right, my number five is one of the best directorial debuts. It's the best directorial debut of the Um, I think it's one of the most accurate films about dating and relationships in the 21st century. And I think it's just a really nice movie, and I'm glad it didn't go where you think it might go. But it's just like how we lose connection with people just because of where we go in our lives and how we get consumed with things. But I think it's a really a beautiful movie. And that was Celine Song's Past Lives. Which is my third favorite film directed by a woman, by a female director. And, and an honorable mention, I really bought the relationship between the two main characters. Like... I also watched a film similar called Violet, and it didn't hit me the way this movie did. No, this is a much stronger film, and but it's also not playing for comedy that much either, like Rylan is. Yeah, but yeah. I just think it's a true, accurate portrayal of like how we connect, and then how we lose connection with people, just like where life takes us. Definitely, definitely. It's a good romance movie. Um, it's, you know, normally we always say rom-com, but this is just rom. This is, um, yeah, just about loving someone and not m maybe necessarily being able to be with them. Uh, the one that got away, they say. Uh, but you can also love someone but not be in love with them because that's two different yeah. emotions and feelings. Yeah. I also I also like the lines of dialogue. I like the conversation her and her husband have about him being like the the typical stock character in these uh, kind of love stories. Yeah. Yeah. How could it have this? Go ahead. I was like, they have some great scenes, either whether it's conversations about the guy or just their day-to-day -day life, like them laying in bed and asking what they want for dinner, and she's like, chicken wings, and he's like, all right, we'll get chicken wings. But I also love the conversation when he shows up and they're talking about her husband, and it's like, yeah, he likes the Korean food. They're like, really? That's really spicy. You know? I just, yeah. I do think uh, the two lads were really good, but the main actress, you know, some yeah. part may not be, why isn't she nominated for an Oscar? It's the, heart, it's the heart and soul. Like, she's the best performance in the film. Yeah, she should be nominated. Well, I feel really bad for the Arthur character. Other nomination, even though she's not winning. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Like, what is that? Um, I felt bad for the Arthur character, the husband. I think he kind of got cucked, but also, um, how come it had the same sort of uh start to a relationship as Barbarian, but uh, didn't go the same <laughs> route as Barbarian? Oh, I didn't think about that. Well, it might be why I liked it so much, because I love Barbarian. <laughs> Another film I also love that has a real realistic relationship is Elemental. I refuse oh, yeah. to leave any criticism towards that movie because it's a realistic take on a relationship. That would have been a good double feature, actually. It would have done. It would, have, it would do. This is I'd another one play, of those... I'd say play this one first because they end up together in Elemental. Oh, spoiler. Ah, yeah, you just spoiled Elemental, even though it's the most streamed movie of 2020. <laughs> uh, 
Past Lives is another one of those movies like Anatomy of a Fall where it came out and then everybody talked about it at least one time a week. You know, it was a big, big love yeah. from the get go. Nominated for Best Picture in Original Screen. Twitter or Letterbox once someone saw it. I just, it took forever for me to finally see it. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the long shots at winning Best Picture. Uh, oh, for but sure. Not, critics not love like... it. 96% from the uh, critics, 83 from the audience, and I think it is a great directorial debut. Love and it. introduction to uh, to the actors. Nice. The two leads. Yeah, because um, I think mostly... Well, I don't even know where the male lead was from, but the other two, Greta Lee and the guy playing the husband, I think they're more known for their TV than they are their film work. I think they are, yeah. Um, do do anything at the box office? No. Okay. No, but I don't think it costs that much either. No. Uh, all right. My number four is... To me, one of the funniest movies, well, it is the funniest movie of 2023. It, uh, you know, if you if you like comedy, you like high school movies, you like uh, satirical, then you're going to love Bottoms. This oh, is yeah. pick. so much fun. Uh, uh, you know, it's about two lesbians who are in high school and they start a fight club before graduation i mean one of uh, rob's favorite movies fight club so you know, it, now it, got... it isn't it isn't fight club anymore i've had a conflict of uh film oh, change no and... there's even a david fincher joke in bottom right well all it i is... will say is this is the closest thing to a all female fight club you are going to get. And uh it's not to uh undercredit the, the gifted ladies in this movie, but in a bizarro universe I could see Marshawn <laughs> getting a best supporting actor nomination for his performance in this film because he's hilarious. See I want yeah, I want to do a spin off comedy awards. I need to throw all these ones in, not just the ones that get attention, like the fan favorites as well. Um, the director uh, also co-wrote it with a star, Rachel Sinat, uh, and Ayo Edebriri is in it, and they're both amazing. Just comedy gold. Obviously, Ayo's been winning all the stuff for the Bears, so you know that she's great. Also, theater camp. People love that one from last I year. On my breakout star award. Yeah, uh, yeah. it is just. Yeah. It knows what it is. It and it has so much fun with it. You know, like the the football players are always wearing their not only jerseys but their gear the entire time. Like the entire time. Usually it's like on Fridays, but even still, then you just wear the jerseys. But they're wearing their their shoulder pads and and. Uh, all the pads except for a helmet, you know. But yeah, Marshawn Lynch, super funny. Can't believe that he, they got the performance out of them that they did. Uh, this was just super smart. And again, one of those where it's, when it came out, everyone, you know, who did see it was talking about it. And it just kept on my radar. I finally saw it and I laughed my balls off. Had a really, really good time. I, I, I just I just fell in love with a teenage high school comedy drama last year called The Revenge, and this one didn't have the same effect. kind of like this one a little bit more myself. Than that <laughs> well, enough, if it's a down to opinion. <clears throat> yeah. But it uh, has, has a, that classic feel, but also feels current. So... It That's is. what New Revenge feels like as well. Ooh, yeah, but New uh, Revenge is wearing its influence more on its sleeve than Bottoms is. Yeah. Didn't do well in theaters, but 90% from the critics, 89 from the audience. Number four for Rob. This was also 
the the uh the comeback of a maestro who who is saying that this might be his last movie. This is this is a master of a different art. Not from this country, from Japan. This is a master of anime, one of the greatest art films of all time. And he comes back with Studio Ghibli to make my number four pick, which I think is one of Cody's favourites. It's Boy in the Heron. Yeah, it's going to be just a little bit higher on my list. Lovely. Lovely. We'll discuss that later, Cody. Mm, I think we have two, two, three movies that are still left to be discussed. Okay, yeah. hey, that gives us Cody's number four. <laughs> My number four, and I did not plan for this to be at the spot that it is, but this is how it works sometimes. Um, <laughs> talk about franchise cappers, even though that's a question mark, because I know they're doing spinoffs and other things with this franchise, but they really should let this franchise leave on this one, because they went out on a high note. And it's absolutely one of the best franchises in Hollywood right now, next to the Mission Impossible and next to the Spider-Verse films, and some of the best action. I didn't really think they could top themselves with what they have done in the previous films, but they really did do some... There's just so many iconic, legendary, amazing scenes in this movie and stunts. And it's one of the greatest action films ever made, not as of just this year, but of all time. It's John Wick Chapter 4. On no mention, for sure. Yeah, amazing, but exhausting. Uh, yeah. The best thing, I mean, yeah. It, it, uh, some of my quibbles with it, because, you know, I'm a huge action fan. It was my favorite type of movie. Uh, I love all John Wick's Parabellum was one of my top of that year because uh, of the action and what it did. But yes. This was kind of, you kind of saw the moves coming. It seemed a little bit slow and, and it's because he's so exhausted, you know, but the, when, when the bad guy doesn't chase up on you all at once, like, okay, we could kind of see that happening, but they were like crawling, not even like running towards him because the, he needed more time to kick the person in front of him. But, uh, but the the video game styling with the the over the top from room to room shooting with the shotgun was amazing something that i've never seen before so that was really really well done yes. uh, but i've said this before to you guys uh I, being exhausted from action is i thought was impossible but it I, this movie I made see it possible where you're coming from but i do like how she takes what works about John Wick 2 with the more story driven film and, and the more adrenaline fueled action depth of John Wick 3 and just kind of merged them together so you had a film with, with a gripping storyline and fantastic action. Also, I, I mean, cinematography shines and as well as some great performances Donnie Yang, Bill Skarsgård, yeah. Harishimo Sana, and even English. Bodybuilder Scott Atkins, and he's wearing a fat suit. Oh, in that thing. I mean, yeah, there's the whole, there's the whole, whole the Continental in Japan sequence with the cherry blossoms on the roof and the whole hotel scene. There's the nightclub scene with Scott Atkins and of the whole warriors homage on the streets of Paris and yeah the staircase seems exhausting but it's also incredibly choreographed and it is just up in the ante that I didn't think they could do anymore in no. this franchise and they continue to do it but stop leave it here just, you went out on a high note oh yeah I agree I definitely think it should it, this should be it I, it was it, it was really, really, really well done. Um, and, and you know, could be one of, it's uh, not better than one, but maybe not better than three, but it's definitely better than two. You know, like it's, it's the top of the, of the John Wick franchise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in its and it's a fourth movie. How many four movies can say that? Right. 
not, not R.I.P. Lance Reddick. Yeah. yeah, not many movies. Uh, Lance Reddick, R.I.P. to him. Love, he was great. Um, and also Skarsgård's in this, right? Yeah, he's a great villain, and yeah, I think Donnie Yen's amazing in the film. Oh yeah, and the, yeah. Can't have a good John Wick movie without some good dogs. Yeah, this and is Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah. Old star. Uh, Ninety-four percent from the critics, ninety-three from the audience. Did well in theaters. Four hundred forty million worldwide. Nice, good pick. Yeah. Not from a masterful filmmaker, however. I mean, he's a master of action, though. Yeah. But, but like he's only directed of... John Wick movies so far. So. Yeah. <laughs> we need to do what David Leach has done and branch out into these more unique action films. Maybe he will. I don't Maybe. Know. I think you'll see. He's got a lot of pre production and post production stuff coming. Mm -hmm. Including a Rainbow Six movie and uh, a Highlander film. Nice. All right. Number three. Yes. Number After, three. Very perfect timing because this one is my favorite action movie of the year. And it is very much John Wick esque, except it's based in a, a war setting and uh, also has some Nazis in it. This movie just came out of nowhere. Uh, and that movie is Sisu. Good pick. Yeah. Great Mine action. Mine number three. Yeah. And, Lots yeah of fun. Just, and who doesn't want to see Nazis stuff. get their come up and Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and it's not, this is very, very practical. There's not a lot of stuff that is, you know, overly CGI. Just like John Wick, they wanted to make it real and feel real. And um, this is the time during the, the gold rush. And he's trying to get gold to a bank. Mm -hmm. Also has a dog. I mean, it is literally John Wick. It's just done in a different styling. I thought this styling was really, really smart. Uh, it's also gruesome. There's a lot of things that are, you know, uh, kind of like when that rod goes through his ankle. Like a lot of it is, ugh. but it is uh, just really, really well done. And I like a good war movie. And, you know, they didn't have to uh, CGI a bunch of soldiers in it to make it look like a huge war movie. They just used simplicity and, um, just the means that they needed to use. Uh, this actor, Jorma Tamila, did a great job. And I'm looking forward to seeing what else uh, this director, Jill Mari Hellender, he directed will do. He one did... of my... Rare Exports, one of my favorite yeah. holidays. I have not seen, but uh, I'm excited to see what else is going to come of this guy. Uh yeah, not big in the um in the uh, box office. Ninety four percent from the critics and eighty eight from the audience. <coughs> and we no, love. No, I do think this is a really good film that could help uh, more mainstream audiences progress into international markets because they talk English and yeah, this is just a standard historical action filler. Yep. And uh, yeah, has, has me still thinking about it after seeing it. It came out pretty early in the year. Yeah. That's great. All right. Number three, we're getting down to it. What do you got, Rob? It was also an international pick. One that hails from Spain, a disaster movie, a real life movie. One set in the 70s, based on the true story of the Uruguayan rugby team. This is Society of the Snow, directed by J.A. By J. Bayona. Yeah, same director as The Impossible. And Jurassic Park, Fallen Kingdom. Yeah. In a month. Oh. I need to see that one. That's good. <laughs> Did you see this one, Coach? I have not seen Society of the Snow yet. 
Do you know what it's about? Yeah, it's what Robbie just said. It's about the football team that crashes. And I know they made a movie I'm back in the say. 90s. But it was all, I think, white actors in that one called Alive. Yeah, and, yeah. And I know this one's up for best international film, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, this reminds me. This reminded me a, a little bit of All Quiet, where it's like uh, it's they're telling their story in their own respective way. Mm. Um, yeah, based on the true story, mm. um, the crash is insane. Like, it'll yeah. make you squeamish. I mean, the rest of the movie will also make you squeamish, but the crash yes. it just really sets the tone for what we're embarking on. Uh, and, you, and you literally like to see these guys like do anything they can to survive in these mountains. What would you do to get you know to survive in in like what what kind of uh, process do you think you would take to? to, oh, to I, live? I, I've, I've seen other media do what they do. Oh my gosh, yeah. I don't know if I could. One of the things that uh, was in uh, like hard to kind of put you know deal with with this is we don't know which character is kind of like who because they're always bundled up and and you know because they're in the snow and stuff and i get um, that but i'm glad it was a group of unknown and i don't think you needed to root for one specific character you're rooting for the whole team to survive and it is a shame that that, uh, that some of them don't make it yeah and being out in the snow for that long, 71 yeah. days, is crazy. Like, there's no um, protagonist. It's the whole team you're kind of rooting for to survive. Yeah. Uh, this is about survival and um, winning. Yeah, my fucking does the score. And, yeah, that is probably – and the cinematography is great. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is a beautifully shot movie. It, I, I, it is some of the most raw stuff that you'll see, um, literally. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, one thing happens after the other. It's you're on the edge of your seat, and you're also grossed out. Yes, but it is really, really well done and an unforgettable film. Yes, ninety-one percent from uh, the critics, eighty-six from the audience, and uh, yeah, didn't have a big run at the theaters because it's a Netflix film. Yes, I hope you enjoyed this one, Cody. Yeah, uh, I yeah, go in like having eaten like three hours ago, but not hungry yet for for the rest of the meals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't eat dinner while up. Uh, Yes, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> which is, well, so I didn't know what was in. I didn't know what I was in for. Uh, yeah, number three from you, Cody. Oh well, my number three is not an international film, though. It probably did great internationally because it's the biggest movie of the year, and its character I think is internationally known. If you'd have told me I was going to enjoy this movie as much as I did before it came out. I would have been, and I would have said no, but I should have known that Greta Gerwig, she's directed two previous films I loved. Why wouldn't I love this movie even more? Because, like the Lego movie, it seems like a dumb idea, but it's so much more than a movie based off a toy or a product. It's the blockbuster smash Barbie. What's to say? It's probably the most entertaining movie of the year. It's just it, is, a lot of it is one of the most entertaining movies. Surprisingly, I am. I'm also surprised that Barbie was my number six. I have never been into Barbie. I grew up at a time where the boys played with action man and the girls played with Barbie. But I but, think because they they made this a satire, but also had enough wit and insight to make it about the gender politics of being a man and a woman in modern society. What? Literally, literally, because you have like, um, I would have wanted to see more about Barbie kind of learning what it's like to be human. But I do really like the subplot with Ken taking over Barbie Land. It, it's just such a really fun fantasy s concept that's been put in a different light. Uh, let's just face it, Ryan Gosling is the star of the show. 
he, he departs from his dark and wooden characters and just fleshes out into this fun, energetic Cam. I don't know if he's the star, but he definitely does a great performance and brings more to it than you would think. But that's part of the comedy and the satire of this because that's the joke of it, right? What is Ken? You know, he's just the dude that hangs around Barbie. So they did a really good well, job with that. Like the beach all day. Yeah, he just knows how to beach. That's it. But that's the true star of this movie. It's production design and Barbie Land. Incredible. Incredible. The music um, numbers are great, too. Limited CGI I mean, as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a cartoon come to life. It's just really, like... I, I can't imagine that, that fantastic soundtrack. Do you link uh, Lizzo? Okay, I'm not big on Sam Smith or Billy Eilish, but their songs are fine. And even Ryan Gosling sings "I Just Can" in the in a musical f. It's something that shouldn't be in there because the film's not a musical, but it's the big musical moment of the film. Mm -hmm. Plus, this film has Will Ferrell, so, and he's normally funny in, in anything he's in. I think, like, a lot of the supporting actors are great, too. Kate McKenna, Michael yes. Sarah. Yes. And America. America. Yeah, nobody's talking about why America Ferrera is nominated. Like, she did a whole monologue about how women is treated in society. It's the heart and soul of the movie, though, so it makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, this movie is the biggest cultural phenomenon that has happened in a really long time. I yes. think Barbenheimer was one of the biggest things that to ever happened to movies, period. Uh, I can't believe that it blew up as much as it did and how both movies are so successful. Um, one of them is a, a movie for, or for your dad. And the other is a movie for your your mom and sort of uh, younger lady audience. But, my but it's also a movie that's... The Watch up and Hotimer. It's made for everybody. It has something for everybody in it. And it is culturally now and um, knowing. And I think Greta had a lot more to lose for this movie than what Nolan did for his movie. And I think that it is, it'll, it'll go down in history. I mean, it definitely already is. Um, Absolutely, it's but the biggest right. movie. Because if Oppenheimer wasn't a huge hit, it wouldn't have been a big deal. Christopher Nolan would have got to still be Christopher Nolan. But had Barbie not been a huge success, who knows what it could have done to Greta Gerwig's career. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, she's three for three in my eyes. Uh, uh, nominated for right? eight Oscars. I I, I swear they director, director. No, it would have been tied with Killers of Flower Moon. Margot Robbie but... deserves just as much credit for how well this movie was made. Not just because she's the star and the lead of this movie, but she's also a producer, so she was creatively responsible for a lot of the tone of the movie, and she personally picked Gerwig to direct this. Nice. Yeah, very, very smart. Um, yeah, I thought they took this away, uh, This the, where you can only have one song nominated, but they did nominate two songs for, uh, yeah. for the Oscars. Also up for Best Picture, Best Supporting Actress, Best Supporting Actor, Adapted Screenplay, Production Design, and Costume Design. Will it win anything? We need to have the whole Glass Onion debate again about whether Barbie should be adapted or original. I mean, I don't know why it's adapted. It's based off a toy. It's not like there's Barbie books and comics and yeah. Like I don't, I don't know why either. No, it's, I it's, think a made, either. it's a made-up story. It is a made-up story. You know, Barbie hasn't appear, appeared in a theatrical film beforehand. Oh, I know why. Because of uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if for any Snyder fans out there, but I laughed. 
fell out of my chair when they made a Zack Snyder joke in Barbie. Yes. It was priceless. But I enjoyed the 2001 bit as well. Definitely. Uh, I don't think there's one human on this planet that doesn't know about this movie. 88% uh, from the critics, 83 from the audience. Nice. Yeah. Even if All you right. didn't like it, you know of its existence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, if you didn't like it, that means you liked Oppenheimer more. <laughs> um, that's just the type of movie goer you are yeah uh, alright my number two um, comes from uh, from a director who did like you said uh, Rob really well the first time around but then you did something almost completely different and, and weird again I'm, this is the year of weird and I don't care if it's disgusting and you know, it's like you can't believe like some of the stuff that you saw in this movie. That's good because that means it's never been done before or quite like, uh, you know, the some people might say that it's a little bit like um, Talented Mr. Ripley, which, yeah, in a way it is. But uh, uh, put it in your own words and make it your own. And that's what uh, Emerald Fennel did in Saltburn. Saltburn is fantastically done. Barry Kagan delivers a phenomenal leading role. Yeah, he did a really good job. I think, uh, I think, you know, I mean, it's these people aren't necessarily known. You know, we know him a little bit more from uh, last year. He was also nominated for Best Supporting Actor, but also Jacob Elordi, who's, you know, from. And, and uh, uh, he, from Gran Turismo. Euphoria, um, uh, Archie from Gran Turismo, but uh, you know those are some unknowns. But then we also have knowns like Richard E. Grant, Rosamund Pike, and also uh, you got a little bit of Carrie Mulligan in there. Um, and and and, it, an act, it, and an actor I like called Reece Shearsmith, who appears at the start of the film as his professor. He's in the Venom movies as a priest, and he's also in See How They Run. Yeah, I think people were just too disturbed with this movie, which is why it's not nominated for anything. I think uh, Barry's been getting it, you know, a lot of love otherwise, uh, everywhere from uh, from Rosamund the Pike, Oscars. Too. So is Rosamund Pike, yeah. Uh, I think this could have been up for original screenplay because it's one of the most original things out there. Yes. You know, it is unforgettable. It is. Yes. There are things that Barry Kilgan does in this movie that people are talking about, and will there will be more jokes about Salper than any other movie at the Oscars for sure because of how just insane it is. But everyone's talking about it. It's it, it's now on uh, Prime, so people all, are watching. All it. I am going to say is, you will not listen to Murder on the Dance Floor in the same way again after you watch this movie. Or look at that up the same. That on Prime. It's um well, I'm not surprised you love this movie as much as you did, Justin, because Babylon was your favorite movie of last year. And a lot of people are comparing this to Babylon, though some people are also comparing it to Don't Worry, Darling from last year too. Which I so. I also did enjoy. Um yeah, the cast is phenomenal. I think Jacob Elody and Barry Kilgan have a huge career ahead of them. Even Archie Matakiwi, uh, Matakwe. A low-key good performance than Priscilla as Elvis Presley. Oh, totally. I really enjoyed Priscilla a lot. I think uh, that that um, that young lady, Spagle, should have been given some more opportunity. Uh, but she was great. He was great. Yeah, I think he's going to become a superstar. And I think this movie just really worked all the way down to the naked dancing at the end. What else you got to say about it, Rob? Because this was your number six? Uh, eight. Eight? Yeah. It's just really well done how... I mean, this film was never going to be as good as Promising Young Woman. But I'm kind of glad that she's still trying to figure out her style and still trying to figure out uh, where she's going. But yeah, give us... Give us more pop songs and give them more of a little dark twist because I can't listen to Toxic in the same way thinking about Promising Young Woman and obviously this film kind of kills a childhood classic of mine. Huh. 
I think the what happens at the end of Promising Young Woman is more interesting than sort of the end of this movie. But Definitely. Yeah. I enjoyed this overall. I thought it was more entertaining, and and Saltburn is a character in itself, uh, which is a place. It's a castle. Oh, I just a, I just feel like Promising Young Woman has a bit more depth to it. We know why she's doing what yeah. she's doing. So okay. Barry didn't have a motive about anything he does. That's a spoiler. Uh, um, like um, this? Um, everything I say about a movie is a spoiler. Well, you have definitely spoiled two movies. Um, Cody, what, did you, you like this one? I did enjoy it. I did enjoy it as much as you guys because it's only an honorable mention for me because of what you said. Like, there is parts of it that it almost becomes beat for beat, like the talented Mr. Ripley. But the performances are fun. Rosamund Pike, Richard E. Grant, Lordy's good. Even Barry Keegan. I mean, these actors are always good. I think Emerald Fennell got an interesting style. I can't wait to see what she does next. I don't Definitely. even think we know what our style is yet. This this is almost, you know, each movie has some thematic uh, similarities, but are done completely different. I mean, even Mulligan's little part is great, too. I mean, it's it's just a fun watch. It and, is a watch. And yeah, it goes some really audacious places that will drive some people crazy, but I'm like, okay, go for it. Be a freak, Emerald Fennell. You, you, you yeah. wait a freak. You let that freak flag fly. Yes. Um, did get some BAFTA nominations, but nothing else. BAFTAs are great. Uh, 71% from the critics, 79 from the audience. Nice. Number two for Rob. It's already been mentioned by KD. I think this is a director's magnum opus since his groundbreaking film Inception. It's Oppenheimer. All right, Cody, take it away. Well, I got, I mean, I mentioned some of the stuff, but I mean, I just thought it was really incredibly well done by a master filmmaker who does movies about obsessive men. I mean, Oppenheimer is an obsessive man, and even the people who don't like Oppenheimer are obsessive, like trying to get rid of him or devalue him. But I. <laughs> This has a lot to say about what is the cost of our creations and, you know, what effect does it have on the world and how responsible are we for what happens. And you understand why they develop this stuff, but at the same time, you're like, but at what cost? And also, Matt Damon's really good in this movie, too. I mean, like, every actor comes in and brings their A-game, for even if it's only for, like, five minutes of screen time. You know, it's Seth, Jason Clark. I mean, Alden Allright is great in his little stuff with Robert Downey Jr. I mean, and the use of black and white and color in here. I mean, it's just a well-shot, well-made. The score is amazing. It looks great. I mean, Christopher Nolan went all out, and he might finally get what he's been searching for with this movie. Definitely, definitely. But let's just talk about that bomb scene. Like, it's not made with CGI. It is made with practical effects, and they're not even, they're not, and they're not even recognizing this film. The visual effects, it's criminal. It, it annoys me. If there's one nominated category, you should have nominated it in. Yeah, put it in here because, like, you know, no offense to the costume designers, but I mean, that's the one nomination. I was like, Oppenheimer, what you doing in costume? But it's it's the screenplay. It, it it plays it plays out in such a weird way. It plays out like poetry, and it's well, written in a way that is non-linear. And if you even try and think about changing the the pattern of of the screenplay to make it more chronological, it just wouldn't work. No, you would you would be bored if this was in chronological order. It would feel like a three hour epic if it was in chronological of the time. You like the back and forth. It's like it's almost it's almost like three different movies. You know? We've got the 
we gotta we gotta race the clock to win the war and then yes. it's the yes. sport drama aspect with them trying to keep Oppenheimer being a communist and then you got like the whole conspiracy JFK stuff going on with Robert Downey Jr. Little and, and, and that man and that man Robert Downey Jr. is the best actor in the movie. This 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 is an important role for him. Does I see this the I see this performance as as just a career defining performance for Robert Downey Jr. Nobody has had the caliber of career this man has had. Nobody has had the drama this man has had. This man this man's journey has been leading himself to an Oscar and this is the perfect film for him to win on. Nobody has had the career this man has had. You're on mute, Justin. You're on mute. Yeah, sorry, the, the dogs were barking. This was your number eight code? Or uh, number nine. Number nine. Uh, it's undeniable how um, the feat that Christopher Dolan had for this film. The production design really is is very uh, noticeable to me. I mean, they had to build oh, a whole new city. Um, and then, of course, all the acting is incredible. Uh, I don't see Killian Murphy as a as a great lead, in my opinion. Um, I am. You're not going to be annoyed if he wins Best Actor, are you? Look, if you're going to win an Academy Award for Best Actor for knowing a lot of lines, then yeah, he deserves it. But. I don't think he gave me anything else besides somebody who knows a lot of lines because he is pretty much in every frame of the movie. Um, I think he portrays the the the, um, the conflict that Oppenheimer has with what he's doing in the movie. Yeah. Well, I think the visuals and the supporting cast helped him shine oh, so much. Absolutely. But I mean, I can't think of another actor who could have played the role. You know, I can't. I can't. Not even Bale, not even DiCaprio, not even Tom Hardy. Like, the more regular leads. Uh, it is a stacked it's nice to give him an actor no one has worked with probably more than, other than Michael King, give him, like, the big spotlight. Um, yeah. I don't know if he's for sure going to win, because they could give it to Giamatti, because, you know, they could feel like it's Giamatti's time. Giamatti just made it so much. But I mean, that role could have been, you know, played by Killian Murphy, and and it would have been so bad. But Paul Giamatti elevates that character. Too bad nobody's talking about the whole. I, I can't. I can't even see that being a role Cillian would even audition for. Uh uh, I, again, it's undeniable what happened with this movie. Uh, what, how big it, it is, really well, and, and and done really well. It's undeniable. Nobody can deny. Uh, it already is number eighty on the top IMDb as far. I mean, and it just came out last year. The, o the yeah. only downside I have to this movie is they should have gave Mrs. Oppenheimer all to do. Yeah, especially since yeah, well. Been... The Give give someone of her caliber more to do. Oh, yeah, both hey, both of the main uh, females. You, you can't people. really give Florence much to do because of if you look at the history of her character, she died before the events of the atom bomb test. So either way, she was going to be a, a minor role. I'm assuming she just accepted this role just to work with Christopher Nolan. The yeah, scientist, I forget the actor's name, he was a child actor. The scientist who's always giving Oppenheimer food. That was a really solid supporting performance in this movie. Oh, Alex uh, uh, Scott Grimes. And it was I thought it was David. No, Scott Grimes, the one that voices Steve in American Dad. He's, you're, he's on about the lad from Hereditary. Uh, Kenneth Branagh. No. Alex uh, Tony Goldwyn. No, oh. and ghost. Jason Tony Goldwyn is one of the prosecutors. Let me let me pull it up. 
Scott, I, I'm, I'm telling you, it's Alex Wolf. They got from the Jumanji movies. No, it's not Alex Wolf. It's the heavy set Jewish scientist. Oh, Josh Peck. No. <laughs> He's not heavy set. Um. Um. Oh, where is his name? I'm trying to pull it up. You guys know who I'm talking about. He was an Adam. Josh Hartnett. Guy. No, he's great too, though. But he's very American. Uh, he oh, was good though. Okay. Uh, David Dasmalchian. That's who. No, no, but Dane DeHaan. Good. No. <laughs> it's so David Crumpholt. That's his name. I know who you're thinking of now. He's really good. Yes, he's really good. But I mean, there's a ton of people in this movie that are good. Um, Dane DeHaan's almost as creepy as Casey Affleck is in this movie. Mm -hmm. And so is Dave Dale Smonson. They're that, That's yeah. like the three creepy boys in the movie. David yeah. Crumholtz. Oh, right. From uh, um... Santa Claus. Yeah, Santa Claus. He was in yeah, Ten Things I Hate About You. Yeah. 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 Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Yeah, he's good. Uh, nominated for 13 Oscars, the most of this year. Uh, best picture, best director. Yeah, you said costuming already. Um, it's loading actor, still. But, yeah, at, best actor. Screenplay, supporting actor, um, production design, uh, and four more. But it's still Top loaded. Two, cinematography score. Score. Nice. All right. Good pick. Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you. 93% of Rotten Tomatoes, 91 from the audience, and is almost made a billion dollars worldwide. So I think it did pretty well at the box office. About to do a drum roll, but I forgot I got to do my number two. Yes, which I have a feeling was a tie. Number two is a tie. Uh, they are two films of the same style. Well, they're not the same style, but I guess if you want to call it a genre, they are of the similar genre one is by a master filmmaker perhaps making his final film which is this does end up being his final film it kind of makes sense because it is a film kind of referencing all of his other works and just the subject of the film it's a beautiful yeah. film and then the other film is just one of the best animated films superhero movies out there they're upping the game with the animation style they're putting more heart and soul into this character than marvel could ever do themselves in the mcu so my tie for number two is across the spider verse and hayu miyazaki the boy in the heron sweet see i'll just dive into the boy in the heron first quickly before you take this away yeah this is kind of the ultimate Studio Ghibli experience has a lot of references to every single Studio Ghibli film. Has the animation, has the standard animation and character arc and an event and this whole like coming of age adventure. It has a lot of like their old kind of kind of arcs from it, like the romance plots, the whole uh, the whole meeting a young woman. Member of your family from when they're young, and let's not forget about the fantastic voice ass. I had the pleasure of watching the English dub. You see Christian Bale, Florence Pugh, David Batista, Mark Hamill, Willem Dafoe, all giving all giving really good solid voice. I'm not, I'm not forgetting about Robert Pattinson. I'll save the best for last because he just does something with his voice, which is just incredible. This is a love letter to not just Miyazaki, but to Studio Ghibli as a whole. If you love anime, if you love Studio Ghibli, this is for you. If you're not being on anime, I wouldn't say, say rush to see this. You need to watch at least 
all the ones Miyazaki has directed first, or at least the majority of them, so you understand the journey of this studio as well as the adventure of this movie. And let's not forget about the score that could rival Luke Wood, but sadly wasn't nominated. Should have been. Yeah. Beautiful yes. score. Beautiful yes. The Boy and Heron is my crown animated film of all time, but I know Cody loves to do his his animation as a tie, so take it away, I've Cody. Two years in a row, haven't I? <laughs> yes. What what was what number was this for you, Rob? Uh four. Okay. Take it away, Cody. Uh I mean what else? I mean, Robbie pretty much summed up uh, Boy and the Heron. It is like a love letter to not just Hayao Miyazaki, but Studio Ghibli. There are a lot of references, but just the plot line of like creating something and leaving a legacy and then putting it into the hands of the next generation is kind of what this movie is saying. And it's a movie about life and death and love and relationships and the imagination. It hits all the Miyazaki highlights. So it's an absolute must-watch if you're a fan of either Studio Ghibli or Miyazaki. And when you watch you know, it... People, I, I was going to say, when you watch it, if this does end up being Miyazaki's last film, it does feel like that, just because of what the movie is saying. I haven't seen it, but you know what other movie that came out last year that's animated that does the same thing for its studio? Wish. I have not seen Wish, though I hear a lot of people did not like Wish. No, it, it was a box office bomb, and uh, yeah, I mean nobody's talking about it. But it, I watched it while I was, you know, waiting to to record here, and it's a it's a love letter to Disney. So I don't, I mean, I don't know why people don't like it, but anyway, I guess, uh, I guess me, he did it better. He is the master. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And with uh, Spider-Verse, I don't know if it's better than Into the Spider-Verse, but it's just as good in my opinion. And it's because not only did they do even more stuff with the animation that they did in the first one by almost every version of the Spider-World you go to, it's a different style of animation, but they give Miles and Gwen characters particularly so much heart and story that you feel for them. And it's, it's something that you don't normally get in most superhero movies, and they're doing this in an animated movie while also doing all these incredible wild things with the animation and making it fun. And I mean, it, it really is the Empire Strikes Back of this franchise with how they set it up and how it's constructed. Yeah, it, to me it had the Dead Reckoning... Uh... A curse, which if you put a part one before it, it's gonna, it's it's already gonna make me not, you know. I think I it's understand a, that. I understand that, but I I was just completely in from beginning to end, and also I'm a big fan of uh, two sequels that do this: like Back to the Future Two and The Matrix Reloaded. Like the, those are yeah. two other movies that's very similar in style. Okay, 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 okay. I'll admit. I'm not big on the two and three Matrix films, but I do enjoy Across the Spider Verse. It's just, it's the same with Justin and Everything Everywhere. I just want some a bit new, new and something. And I feel like this film plays about it's a little bit too long for an animated film. I like the last twenty minutes for sure, but also. Yeah. Uh, just like Oppenheimer, there's no den uh, denying how good the animation is in this movie and, uh, and across the Spider Verse. It is, ne I mean, you won't ever see anything like that. It's, it's, it's different. It's different every every sort of big. Scene. Here's what I do like about this one is how Gwen's the protagonist. Mixing um, it up, sole protagonist, but they definitely give her character more to do than what they did in the first one and. Flesh her out more because it's still very much going on and, with my and, and I love Haley Steinfeld. She's an amazing actress. She deserves more credit than she does. She deserves better roles than she does. And this and this film shows the range of her acting. 
Did really well in theaters, did The Boy and the Heron. Uh, you're breaking in 165 globally, uh, sitting at 97% on Rotten Tomatoes and 88% uh, uh, from the fans there. Uh, and over for Spider-Man. Um, did really well at the theaters as well. Um, sitting at ninety-five uh, percent from the audience and ninety-four from the I mean ninety-four from the audience and ninety-five from the critics. Uh, before we get into our number ones, can I just quickly say two on the mentions that we've not uh, talking about? Okay. Um, yeah. One one of them is Al Conde, it's a really uh, underrated hidden gem about uh Vampires mixed with a bit of history. It's about a Chilean dictator who has lived as a vampire for years and he's seeking out death. And there is a couple of twists and turns that make it quite fun to watch. Unlike Bo was afraid, this one knew it just wanted to be a silly satire on politics and vampires. And um, there's a British one that came out. Uh, if you guys like Jim Bob, then I recommend The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry. It's a bit like nice. the straight story, but he walks instead of uh, rides a tractor. Oh, okay. Across Spider Verse made 690.8 million. And both Boy and the Heron and Across the Spider Verse are up for best animated feature. Yes. Who's winning it? Uh, it's 50 50 between the two of them. 50 50. And, I know, go... and I know this is technically a 2022 release for you guys, but I did love Pearl. Yeah, Pearl. Okay, well, we'll do, I'll do thing. honorable mentions after we're done here. Sweet. I just want to just get those out of the way. Okay. okay. Yeah. My number one has been my number one the entire year. And, you know, Sopern almost beat it. Oh, very good. <laughs> they could be interchangeable, really. I can watch both these movies right now and be super happy. But I was very impressed with the first product biopic of the year, and it was Air. Uh, this is on, the on. the struggling Nike shoe company, which you can't. Are those words? I can't. I can't even believe those words went together. Nike being a struggling shoe company, which is one of the biggest companies in the world. Um, has for some reason people love not only Nikes but what they became, which is Air Jordan shoes, because they spent all their money on one person to make it as big as it was, and that was Michael Jordan. Um, performances by Matt Damon and Viola Davis are uh, incredible. Viola Davis is the best supporting performance I've saw a year. Uh, and uh yeah jason bayman's also in it ben affleck is the director of this film also co-stars uh and then chris messina chris tucker jay moore rounded out um but yeah uh matt damon and ben affleck are together again and i think this was a winner it didn't have any sticking power you know quite like uh, a lot of movies out there who end up um, like everything everywhere all at once. Uh, but I thought it was really, really well done. And I do think it's differently shot than what uh, um, how Blackberry is. I don't think it was necessarily so straight through. I think this was a lot of in your face and sort of uh, 80s, 90s feel to it because that's where we were transported to. And I thought, that the um, coloring and everything really worked. Uh, yeah, this is like a lot of movies this year, just has a really good cast that bring this movie uh, to where it is and elevate it to where it is. And Viola Davis is queen. Air it was my number one the entire year. Yeah, uh, honorable mention for me. It's a lot of fun. I think this was still my favorite of the product films that came out and i think the yeah, one thing same. that uh 
elevates it not just because Ben Affleck directed it, but also like everybody's good in there. Like, yeah, it's mostly mm-hmm. Matt Damon, but Viola Davis is great. I mean, Chris Messina gives Glenn Howerton a run for his money for a similar style of performance. And he's good. I mean, Chris Tucker even has some good stuff in it. Like, it's just a really fun movie about something that you wouldn't think would be an interesting movie, even though we know what the outcome of the movie is going to be. It was just a lot of fun. And this is an honorable mention of mine, too. But, I mean, Matt Damon is Matt Damon's perfect in these kind of roles. Like, this is he is. what he does. Good. He is, he is. And even though this does look like an advert for the Air Jordan trainer itself, there's a lot more to it because I love the heartwarming story and the way how Alex Condy crafts a good story about these events. And you don't really need Michael Jordan to be in the movie. This film isn't about him. It's about how they save the company. And I love how Ben Affleck captures the 80s aesthetic through the amazing production design. The soundtrack that should be in the talks of some of the greatest soundtracks of all time. And Robert Richardson, the legend, he crafts some fantastic cinematography. Mm -hmm. If if you're a sports fan or or a fan of Ben Affleck directing, I would recommend it to somebody. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a movie made for your dad, so I guess I'm becoming a dad. I really enjoyed <laughs> it. 93% of Rotten Tomatoes, 98% from the audience. Um, it's on Amazon Prime now and made 93 million worldwide, so made its money back. But you're, you're gonna get now. Oh, no, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a good uh yeah i'm just surprised that a movie the one of my first favorites of the year stuck around with me so long uh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Number one. all right and now we're on the rob's number one. Oh, this is funny actually it turns out me and cody have the same number one May I please announce it, Cody? Sure, go ahead. All things. Nice. Let's hear it. Poor things. Is Yorgos Latimos's most recent film, and he is a director. That surprises me. I loved him since I first watched The Favourite back in 2020. And I've checked out the Lobs thing coming in with Naked Deer, and I love his directing style. And this movie, he has a complete blast of it, creating this Victorian esque steampunk world that just is just beautiful to look at. Robbie Ryan captures this world through amazing cinematography. If, if there is one cinematographer to ride for Oppenheimer, it is him. The performances Emma Stone, Willem Dafoe, Mark Ruffalo deliver career best performances. That best actress award is Emma's. I also love the supporting cast: Jerry Carmichael, Rami Yosef, Christopher Abbott, Catherine Hunter. All add to these really fun and colourful and complex characters. Sure, this film is a little bit raunchy, but it's the visuals that make it work. The costume design, the hair and makeup really add to these characters. The score is unique and it really plays the tone of this movie and comedy is not dead. This is the funniest film of the year. I could not stop laughing how good it is. And like Oppenheimer, it's also a bit of black and white in colour. If you love yeah. fantasy, if you love comedy, if you love like all these big worlds, like this, the real tone, and just really just want to see a director who is just good at so good at directing. I recommend Poor Things. Yeah, is it's a, you like it too, Cody. It, it's a beautifully well made film, it's, it's gorgeous looking. The cinematography is amazing, the production design is amazing. I love that it's like this. Steampunk Terry Gilliam 
Tim Burton-esque version of Victorian England. I think Emma Stone is incredible in this movie because she's having to play a child that's learning to grow. This movie actually would be an incredible double feature with Barbie because it would. It so would. They have a lot in common. I mean, Mark Ruffalo, it's great to finally see Mark Ruffalo acting again and not just being the Incredible Hulk. And he's Definitely. playing like a, a devious, hilarious character that's just a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. Um, I love the message in this movie. It's a oh, lot of fun. Uh, it's Tony McNamara again writing the script, who wrote, of course, the script to the favorite. Yorgos is unique and bizarre sense of humor work for this if I, could, if I could find a book or an audio book i would actually wouldn't mind like checking it out um but yeah the supporting cast is all incredible even for their little bits and scenes they have in this movie it's just a just a really well made and you know it's basically Frankenstein, but like we're gonna do it from the Bride of Frankenstein's perspective this time, and her and have comedy instead of horror. Yeah, like this could also be a Guillermo del Toro movie. Also, it has a lot of those types, but it's it's a lot of fun, and it's um, I'm glad that it's one of the top movies at the Academy this year because it deserves it. Yeah, second most nominated movie. Already ranked number 98 overall on IMDb. And again, I told you it's the year of weird. This movie's weird. But boy, does it work. Do you uh, like this one, then? I like it a lot. They didn't end up in my top 10, obviously. Uh, not even in my top 20. But it is really, really just masterfully done. It's like... Oppenheimer, you can, it's undeniable. I mean, it's beautiful the way I. I don't really care for the fish islands, and the only reason why this movie doesn't isn't ranked higher for me is because I wasn't bought into this movie until Mark Ruffalo came in, and that's forty minutes in, unfortunately. So the it's first is quicker than that, like twenty minutes. No, it's like forty minutes before he gets in there. And it, yeah, that's uh, like an act of them like filling out. Yeah, he's great. I mean, just like you said, I'm glad to see him able, able to just act in something instead of be CGI'd. He is uh, one of the greatest actors out there. I'm really, really happy that he's getting the recognition that he's getting. Yeah. And um, he, he, you know, um, when you're a great actor, you you want to be and you're up against and you're acting with somebody, you want to give that best, that sort of same best performance. And I think Emma Stone and Mark Ruffalo really worked to get well well together, and they just were going fist for fist over who's going to be the better actor, and they both nailed it. Um, to this one is the this only thing has a mic drop ending too. Like this movie is. Oh like, yeah, yeah. Do, so do you much. think this award is Emma? I I uh, think she's about seventy five percent chance getting it, but I don't think Lily Gladstone's out of the fight. Yeah. Okay, it's just, it, it's just when some are nominated for the Baf. No, aren't nominated for Baftas. I can't see them winning Oscars. I mean. It really surprised me that the BAFTAs and the Oscars went completely different directions last year. Well, it could happen again. The yeah, only I, wonder how, um, I wonder, is the BAFTA strictly all British? Like, it's all British? Because no. they catch it across the world now. No, it can't be, because there are American winners who are probably BAFTA. And the Baptists no, and the Baptists are all about like giving like, all the films a chance. Part of the nomination pool. This is the only movie that I think could take down Oppenheimer to win Best Picture. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too because Holdovers didn't get that director nom. No. Um, and then if any. Uh, I have a weird feeling that that Sandra Hugh Weller girl can beat Lily and Emma both. 
That would be a big but I, shock, but not surprising because of how much international pool there is in the Academy now, which is why, you know, we got two international best picture nominees. Both of them got in director. So uh, Zone of interest, I'm a little bit worried, could take the title of best picture. Absolutely not. I don't think it's going to get best picture. It's getting best international feature. Yeah. Uh, I also haven't seen it, so I don't know. Yeah. That's actually, I haven't seen that one yet either. It's the only one I haven't seen of, of the nominees for best yeah. picture. What, what, what were you asking me, me earlier, Cody? The nom the people who nominate are they all mostly British for the Bastos? I'm not sure. I'll have to double check for you. Uh, this movie has already made is making fifty six million uh, uh, domestically, which is pretty big for an art house movie like this. Nominated for eleven Academy Awards, including makeup and hair, score, picture of the year, director. Actress, I wish they would make more boy. original fantasy films more accessible for a younger audience. Like I can't show a child this. There's too much sex no. in it. No, no, there's can't. there's a there's a lot of fantasy movies out there. This, I mean, even yeah. Sogmirds and Snakes is fantastical. Uh, adapted screenplay, cinematography, film editing, production design, and costume design. Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good, and one that people are talking about. This is a this is a movie lovers film here. Oh, it's oh, yeah, it's a British and American joint movie. There's mm. a movie I'm surprised it's not on your list, Justin. It might be an honorable mention. Yeah, well, yeah, I understand why people would think that. <laughs> No, I'm saying um, there's a surprise that didn't end up on your list. I don't, I don't no, I know. I, if if you know me, uh, yeah, people, um, uh, they would also be wondering why it's not. But uh, well, that film is, is. I'm thinking it's Iron Claw. Yeah, I would have sworn it would have been in your top ten. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, it it was really well done and and super depressing, but it, I, it, and you nothing, nothing screams like wow, you know, nothing blew me out of the water. Nothing. The only thing that made me think about it was just what happened to the family, you know. But yeah, I was thinking more about the family than than about the movie itself. Yeah. Zach Efron gave me one of the biggest surprise performances of the year. Uh, but I do love wrestling and I do love a good biopic, but it just, um, nothing screamed out to me. The, you know, the, they actually were wrestling and that's great. Um, but it just, uh, didn't hit the mark as much as I and, wanted and, it to. And I, and I watched that Joyride film thinking it was going to be in your top 10. That was well, fun. It's, it's in my top 20, that's for sure. Nice. Yeah. Um, some other... What, 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 would been, what would have been your number 11? Uh, the Creator. Nice. Yeah. Also, I liked uh, Chevalier, Elemental, oh, Joyride. Film. Great film. Poor Things ended yeah, up there cool. in my top 15. Um, Color Purple, Blackberry. Yeah, Great film. And then the three fun blockbusters I think were underrated: uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Blue yes. Beetle, and yeah. the Marvels. That was okay. I had a great time with that. What about you, Cody? Some other fun movies that we didn't mention? Uh, ones that weren't mentioned that would have been honorable mentions for me, of course, is Leave the World Behind, the Netflix film with Julia Roberts and Mahersha Ali, Ethan Hawke. It's a really well done thriller with a banana pants ending. Um, Godzilla minus one, which is an incredible monster movie where you actually care about the people, would make a great double feature with Oppenheimer. Yeah. Uh, of course, <laughs> uh, Wes Anderson's Asteroid City. I yeah. think that's one of the best in Budapest. Uh, 
I was really touched and charmed by Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. I really like that movie. Um, of course, Priscilla, we talked about it a little bit. I really enjoyed that film. Nice. Uh, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Again, one of the best franchises in Hollywood right now. Um, I'm sure I get my letterbox list and see if there's any I missed out. The Holdover. Uh, yes. a really fantastic movie with three great performances. Definitely. Uh, Ferrari, great sound, incredible performance. Let's see Ferrari. Uh, I like Adam Driver. And then, finally, just a really fun movie that's also action, Polite Society. That was just a lot of fun. I like that movie. Oh, yeah. I like that movie, too. Right. For me, I did enjoy uh, The Covenant, the Guy Ritchie movie. I'll give you some some of my horror uh, picks. Really like talk, talk to me. Uh, Scream Six. Knock at the cabin. I thought was a great return form for M Night Shyamalan. And of course, I loved Pearl. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Al Conde is is definitely one. Uh, one I also enjoyed. Uh, Chicken Run Dawn and Nugget was fun. Uh, Flaming Hot was quite sweet. Creed Free was an interesting directorial debut from Michael B. Jordan. I missed this one last year, but I really enjoyed the documentary, All the Beauty, All the Bloodshed. Rustin was great, but the best thing I watched all year was a four-part documentary series on football legend David Beckham. <laughs> you nice. know I'm a football fan. Yeah. Rotten Tomatoes, uh, top 30, just real quick. Oppenheimer, or is it from 1 to 30? Uh, Oppenheimer, Mission Impossible, Killers, Cloud Moon, Spider-Man, Barbie, John Wick, Air, Past Lives, Are You There, Margaret, Holdovers, Mutant Mayhem, Megan, Blackberry, Dungeons and Dragons, Talk to Me, Boyd and Heron, Poor Things, and Amy of Fall, Creed 3, Still, the Michael J. Fox movie, Godzilla Minus One, May, December, You Hurt My Feelings, Guardians 3, Fallen Leaves, All of Us Strangers, which I really love, when Evil Lurks, Passages, Taylor Swift, The Eras Tour, and 1001. So I think between the three of us, we did pretty well. Oh, um, one, more, one, one more fun movie I really enjoyed, the Super Mario Brothers movie. Yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty good. Agreed. Yeah. All right. I think we're all winded. Long yes. episode. I got to go episode. make some dinner. Yes, I got to go to bed. But uh, thank you. Yeah, for right. Yes, yes. Thank you guys so much for doing this. Yeah, I will see you. I will see you both on the seventeenth when we announce the winners. Just didn't so know them beforehand. But it's going to be a big surprise for Cody. No. So you got to be the surprise mm. on this time, as uh, you knew the winners last time, and Justin was the surprised one. Oh, that's right. Okay, gotcha. So I won't know. I, it'll be. Yeah. I'll be reacting. Yes, you'll be the reaction guy this time. All right. Coolio. Sweet. All right. Well, good to talk to you guys. Good to see you. Yes, we will see you too. Um, you had great lists. Really yes. Good. Yes. Like, subscribe uh, to this channel. Let us know. Let us know your favorites in in the comment section. What was that code? I said I wish I had seen more of your list. There's, I think, three or four I hadn't seen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I still need to see. Uh, I think uh, the only one I didn't see on your guys' list was Anatomy of a Fall and the Boy in the Hair. So I need to yeah. see those for sure. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Uh, American Fiction was great, by the way. I watched it before we, we got to... I mean, what a smart, smart, fun film. I'm glad it's up for our best picture. I'm glad Jeffrey Wright's up for best actor. Yeah, I'm glad Coleman's up K. for... Brown. I'm up for... I, I, I'm glad Coleman is up for best uh, actor this year. Yeah, he's great. He's really, really good. Yeah, um, Jeffrey, okay. Wright, Jeffrey Wright's in Rustin and American Fiction. He's great. He is great. 
But yeah, this uh, has been okay. this has been fun. I'll leave you guys to it. Yes, it has been a great time. Thank you guys. Yeah. Good to see you. Thanks everybody for watching. Tell us your favorite movies in the comments of 2023. Yes. And uh, we'll do this again soon. Yes, yes. Once we've all once we've all done the Flemings, found out the Oscars and had a chat about them, we can move on to 2024. Which I've only seen one. One 2024 film. Same. And that's Mean Girls. Oh, Cody, what, have you seen any? Movie. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of big releases until like now. Yeah, Beekeeper. Other than the whole Mean Girls and Beekeeper. That was like it. Really. What, have you seen anything this year, Code? What, what was the Netflix movie? What is that called? It's got Dan Levy in it. Oh, directed. Good Grief. Good Grief, yeah. The only one I saw was... Uh, Self reliance on Hulu, the um, the Johnson guy, the guy from Good Girl. Oh yeah, I've heard about that. Nice. Yeah, nice. got a lot of catching up to do. Good. All right, gents, enjoy the evening. We'll talk Thank soon. You too. Not seeing the eyes. Bye bye. Bye, Bye guys. Bye guys. Bye guys.